This is Sensei Buck Snyder. I'm a martial artist, nature lover, and total nerd. Come have fun with Sensei in the Wild. Hey, what's up YouTube? We have an exciting new insect today. Well, this one is called an Eastern Lubber Grasshopper. If you look here, this is called a Luna Moth. This is the Imperial Moth. And this specific one is called the Pine Imperial Moth. They are called the spur throat grasshoppers. And spur throat is a large group of a bunch of different kind of grasshoppers that all fall under this title. And these, these are specifically called dif uh, the differential grasshoppers. This is called an ox beetle. And this specific one is a female ox beetle. These little guys love to live in pine trees. They love to munch on uh, pine needles and um, sweet gum trees and make it. But the thing is, the moth itself doesn't eat at all. They eat only when they're a caterpillar. Once they transform into this moth, their only goal is to breed. So this little one here is trying to find a mate. I don't know if this is a male or female, but once it finds a mate, it'll breed and then it'll die. They have a very short lifespan once they become a moth. So it's very sad, but look at the size of this. This is actually the, in the family of the largest moths in North America. And what's cool about these moths is their colors. Look at the beautiful, this is actually yellow on purple. And if you look, there are spots on the wings that look like eyeballs, and there are some patterns on the back of the a moth. And those are very, very cool looking patterns. I mean, this is a very distinctive moth, not only because of its size, it can range in wingspan from three to seven inches full grown. If you look at him again, I'm telling you, he's, he's harmless both as a caterpillar and as a moth. And as a caterpillar, they try to find very safe places to live because they have no defenses. And as a moth, it's completely defenseless. And there's been a decline in the population of these moths in recent years because these little guys are extremely attracted to light. They're more attracted to light than a lot of different kinds of moths are. And when they get into light like that, they're exposing themselves to predators. Birds and other predators come in and eat them, and they eat them before they have a chance to breed, so they're not able to have their babies. So that is causing a reduction in the, uh, in the uh, population of this moth, and that's very sad because it's directly related to humans. The more areas that we develop and the more street lights and artificial lighting we come to, these moths are more attracted to it, and then they become prey for uh, some kind of predator. So I know it's a cycle of life for them to become prey, but our, our changes are causing them to get eaten more often than they naturally would have, which is a real shame because this is a beautiful moth and it doesn't do any damage. The caterpillar does eat pine needles, which is very, it's a very fortunate thing because I live here in the piney woods of Texas and I'll tell you, getting rid of these pine needles are a pain in the butt. And if you have a nice little moth like this that'll eat it when it's a caterpillar, that does nothing but help me out. Uh, this moth is one of the biggest ones in North America. It can have a wingspan up to uh, four inches and it can grow as big as seven inches. So that's a huge wingspan for a little insect. And now this one here is a female and there are two definite ways I know this is a female. First of all, the antenna are pretty small. If you look at the antenna, the little bushy ones at the front, they're cool looking, but the males are much bigger and much fluffier. Also, uh, when we found her, uh, I put her in this container here, and she just laid eggs while we have her. We actually witnessed her laying eggs, and I tried to film it. I don't, uh, I wasn't able to get her completely doing it. But if you look there on the underside, those are eggs that she literally just laid on this branch. But um, if, there, if you notice, her wings are green. She's got a brownish pattern along the top, and you can barely make out on one side. There's an eye mark on the wing. She has two of those underneath the top wings. And uh, it's a very beautiful, neat little thing that a lot of butterflies and moths have. And as a larva, uh, it'll change into a caterpillar. And as a caterpillar, it'll molt its skin five different times before it goes into a cocoon to become a butterfly. I'm sorry, become a moth. And when it gets in the cocoon, it's only there for a very short while. It comes out, and then as a full-grown moth like this, she will only live one week. So in this form, they only live one week, then they die. And here's what's interesting about this bug. As soon as she's born, she, her, she wait, lets her wings dry, then she flies immediately to a tree that she prefers. She releases pheromones, and she waits until a male shows up so she can get uh, pregnant and lay her eggs. And because her lifespan is so short, she doesn't have time to wait. 
And here's a very interesting thing. As a caterpillar, they'll eat and they'll eat and they'll eat. And they eat so much, they actually outgrow their skin five different times. And that's why they actually shed as much as they do. But when, when they eat so much as a caterpillar, that when they go into the cocoon and come out as a moth like this, they don't actually eat when they're like this. So you see this moth right here? It has a mouth, but it's called a vestigial mouth, which means it's left over. So it's a mouth that has no function. They will, if they get scared or threatened by a predator, they'll click its mouth parts at an animal, at a predator, and make a clicking sound as a warning. So uh, if you ever find one of these caterpillar larvae, they're green and they have very little hair. If you hear them clicking at you, that's probably a luna moth uh, caterpillar warning you to stay away. So they again, uh, they're not they're not venomous or anything, but uh, that's their method of deterring a predator. They hide during the day and they only come out at night. In the day, uh, daytime, she'd usually be hiding somewhere down in a little hole in the ground or a hole in like uh, plants. They do like eating decayed plants and decayed roots of plants. So uh, they're one of nature's big uh, decomposers. So they're very helpful for rotten plants. Um, their larvae are a little bit, uh, some people consider them pests. They eat roots of plants. So they can, uh, if they get in your grass, they'll turn your grass brown because they do eat up the roots. But they are cool bugs. Look at this one. It's pretty big compared to my hand, if you look. This one is not, I think this one is about as full grown as a female gets. Uh, they, they can get up to two inches long. And uh, if you look, the way we can tell this one's a female, if you can see the little face, it's got a little tiny horn on the bottom and then an indention on this body. That's what a female looks like. Uh, there are two types of males in this species. There's something called a major male and a minor male. The major male actually has big horns on it and looks like a rhinoceros. The minor male has smaller horns on it and still resembles a rhinoceros, but they're much smaller. And that's why these beetles are actually considered part of the rhinoceros beetle family. And the rhinoceros beetles are part of the scarab beetle family. So uh, they only live about six months. So, uh, and they're, they're active really between the months of May and November. Um, I don't want to hold these guys. They can bite, they're not venomous, and if they bite, the bite's actually supposed to be pretty gentle. It's like a little pinch, but I don't even want to chance it. They like to live in the grass, of course, that's why they're called a grasshopper, and uh, they like to eat vegetation. They eat grass of all kinds, but they'll also eat so garden that's vegetables. That's where they become very famous. Uh, when these guys get in big, large groups and attack uh, fields of, of vegetables, they're called locusts. And so the name grasshopper and locust are interchangeable, but only under certain conditions. So what happens is uh, a locust, I mean, I'm sorry, a grasshopper by itself isn't dangerous. It'll eat a little bit and it'll do a little bit of damage, but it's not too bad. Then if certain conditions happen, like a drought or something specific in the weather that causes them to change, they get together and they actually release this kind of uh, pheromone kind of thing that signals all of them to get together in a swarm. And when they do that, they actually change. And once they begin to get in a swarm, they migrate. They start uh, traveling. And when they travel as a swarm, they'll go through and eat vegetation and they'll wipe out entire regions of all their plant life. And yeah, they're very ancient, the, uh, the grasshoppers are, and they've been known as a problem for mankind as history is uh, as old as mankind can be. If you talk, look in the Bible, they talk about swarms of locusts, they refer to them as plagues. And that's what these guys were when they're in a big giant swarm, they're a plague when they hit the field and destroy all the vegetables. So individually they're not dangerous but these guys we when i found these today these were only three that we got there were probably i don't know 30 40 50 of these guys hanging out in the area we saw them so uh they, their populations grow very quickly i think these the biggest ones about full grown i think these guys get two inches full size and i think this one's about an inch and a half almost two inches so these are our full grown again i'm not going to kill a bug just because it's a bug and it has the potential to be something else it has to become that so very specific conditions have to happen for these guys to become a locust swarm so i don't believe that'll happen here and the thing is in 2020 we actually have technology to allow us to monitor these guys and so swarms don't occur like they used to they still happen occasionally in third world countries or in other parts of the world uh, but not so much in america
and these guys can get three inches. And if you look, compared to my index finger, he's almost the size of my index finger. So that is an enormous grasshopper. Uh, they are called locusts when they get in big swarms and uh, they can absolutely knock out all the vegetation in a certain area. By themselves, they're not very dangerous, but when they get in groups, that's when the real issue comes up. But if you look at this guy compared to the other ones, there are a lot of distinct features on him, uh, very different from the other one. I mean, first of all, it's coloration. This one is a much more beautiful grasshopper, in my opinion, especially his wing. If you notice, this one does have an injury. If you look down here where I'm pointing, his actual little foot is missing. He's got his leg, but he doesn't have his foot. If you look here on the other foot, he's got a, a, other leg here, he's got his foot. So he's having a hard time actually jumping and uh, crawling like he's supposed to without that appendage there. So uh, he is at a little bit of a disadvantage. Uh, so, so yeah. So anyway, uh, cool insect. I didn't want to do much with this one because we'd already covered the other one. I'm just, it's just rare that I see this size of one right here in my yard. And again, look at him compared to my palm. Yeah, that's an enormous grasshopper. And that thing's huge. If you notice, this is a, a distinct characteristic uh, for the lovers. The wings only go halfway down their back. When they, that means that the wings stop growing at a certain point, their body continues to grow, and these wings can act, cannot, cannot actually be used. They can't fly with these. So this, once this insect it reaches this size, he can jump, but he can no longer fly. So that is one advantage for the swarms, that a swarm of these guys can't fly up and take out a region as fast because they don't have the ability to fly. But still, uh, they're, they are in Texas, obviously, that's where I got this one, but they're very common in Florida. In Florida, they're apparently taken over and uh, people are just having to deal with living with them all the time because there's just so many of them.